I would like now to move to uh, members' statements. Uh, the member from the member from Leeds Grimble. Comme l'année scolaire tire à sa fin, je vous. The school year is coming to an end, so I would really like to acknowledge the success of the Catholic school of my riding. It is a thanks to the teachers that students can succeed. So I would like to really thank them from the bottom of my heart for their hard work. This school year has been a very busy one. There has been a competition called Miniskills that encouraged students to get interested in trades and technologies. There were also art events so that students could try themselves at poetry and at social activism. And this year, there was also a lot of inspiring competitions in terms of scientific talent, for example. So this is a school that has existed for decades, and I would really like to congratulate all teachers of the Académie Ange Gabriel and thank them for their hard work. I am sure you will continue your good and hard work next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Speaker. As I mentioned earlier, we are joined in the Members' Gallery today by Marianne Mulhern. Marianne is an award-winning poet from Windsor whose work I have quoted here in the House on at least two previous occasions. It was her idea to create the position of a Poet Laureate in Windsor a few years ago. I was on City Council when we did that, and that experience prompted me to introduce a private member's bill to create the position of Poet Laureate for Ontario. Marianne has written a poem called Windsor, and with her permission, I'd like to read it to you now. Windsor, a river seeded with light, radiance of sun and stars, flows through the heart of Windsor, gives breath to 10,000 roses, reflects the face of a city created from strength Men, women, and children, enough faith to endure, enough hope to build bridges, span of this millennium, when Windsor thrives, grows, glories in so many colors of the world, how they shine. Thank you, and thank you, Marianne, for being here today. Thank you for promoting poetry and literacy and the arts, and thank you for reminding others how great it would be if we finally had a Poet Laureate in Ontario. Thank you. And the famous member from the Public Health Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, three weeks ago today, I rose in the House to introduce Bill 101, an act to proclaim Ontario Flag Day. This legislation, if passed, would proclaim that May 21st in each year be recognized as Ontario Flag Day. And I would humbly ask for the support of all members in this House for this bill. First raised on May 21st, 1965, the Ontario flag symbolizes the contributions of our people, our rich history, our diverse heritage, distinct values, and shared successes. It represents all of us who call Ontario home. Le drapeau de l'Ontario est le symbole à la Ontario's flag symbolizes the contributions of our people, of our history, of our diversity, and of our common successes. And Francophone settlers, to the millions of immigrants who continue to arrive on our shores from around the world, Ontario has a rich history and diverse heritage. Millions of people, including my grandparents, chose to come to this province because they wanted a better life for their family and for the generations that would follow. They found that in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. In fact, my grandfather used to say that this is the best place in the world. Ontarians from across our province continue to make contributions to the economic, social, political, and cultural life of our province, our country, and the world. Let's celebrate Ontario's flag so as to celebrate the people of Ontario and their innumerable contributions. And join me in marking May 21st in their calendars in each year, not just to celebrate Ontario Flag Day, although this is important, and not just to celebrate our history, heritage, values, and shared successes, although this too is important, but to pay tribute to the people of Ontario who continue to make Canada and Ontario the best place in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today I launched an awareness program for my private members' initiative known as 
Growing Acre Food Jobs. And I do it in celebrating the local food week that we have upon us right now. And I'd like to share with the House that Ontario's agri-food industry is vital to the province, contributing $30 billion annually to Ontario's GDP and providing 740,000 jobs. Yet despite this important economic aspect of our agri-food industry, we actually have a low job um, profile, if you will, amongst students across Ontario. And that's why I introduced my motion, Growing Ontario Agri-Food Jobs. The motion asks that the importance of agri agriculture and food literacy is recognized by ensuring that the Ministry of Education includes a mandatory component of career opportunities associated with Ontario's agri-food industry in grade 9 and 10 guidance and career education. And uh, with that, I'm very pleased to say that this motion will enable a premier to realize a goal. When she was Minister of Agriculture and Food, she challenged the agri-food industry to create 120,000 new jobs. Yet, unfortunately, studies show that for every one person graduating with an agricultural diploma or degree, there's three jobs waiting. So this has been received very well by the NDP party as well as the Liberal Party, and I look forward to the debate on October 8th during Agriculture Week later this fall. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I was happy to attend the opening of the 40 year racetrack, which is celebrating its 118th year. With post time at 4.15, we had nine races that saw an increase in both tra track betting and off track betting. I can tell you, I was there last year, attendance was up, sales were up. The res uh, residents of Niagara have had a great time yesterday. They want to keep having a great time. That's why we need more race dates. 40 is a good start from where we were, but we need 77 race dates. We also need to return gaming to the track in the form of slots. With the slots back and more race dates, the track can become self-sustaining and not need a dollar from the province or the town. Three years ago, the Premier committed to integrated horse racing with OLG, including gaming, which would bring the slots back to Fort Erie. In fact, it was the Premier's idea. There are over 1,000 jobs that could be protected there and 200 that could be created with the return of gaming to Fort Erie. That's jobs for the community that's absolutely needed. By returning gaming to Fort Erie, the province generates revenue and the town gets to keep their racetrack. This is something that needs to happen now so that we can continue to see more days like the very successful day we had the 40 year racetrack yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. This past Sunday was the 30th anniversary of the Barrie tornado. On May the 31st, 1985, a series of tornadoes swept across the province of Ontario, with the most devastation occurring in central Ontario and my hometown of Barrie. It was a challenging day in our history, with 12 dead, 281 injured, and close to 600 homes and businesses lost or damaged. At 4.15, a powerful F4 tornado with winds between 270 and 310 kilometres per hour formed in Grand Valley, eventually travelling to Barrie. It was a defining moment in our community as neighbours came together to help support one each other, each other and help to rebuild. At Royal Victoria Hospital, those who were injured sat silent and patiently, covered in blood and mud. Ambulance rushed more in as Good Samaritans brought others in pickup trucks. Portable lights were brought in and sheets were placed over tables in the cafeteria as it was used for assessment and treatment. Nurses and doctors returned from already working a full day to do their job again. Police officers, firefighters, paramedics and soldiers from nearby base board and worked tirelessly to get Barrie citizens through this very difficult time. In the weeks ahead, neighbours took in those who had lost their homes and the city began to rebuild. Barrie Tornado's devastation was significant, but it relieved, revealed an even stronger resolve and a sense of community. This resilience is still part of our community today, thanks to all of the unsung heroes who acted on this very devastating day. Thank Thank you. Thank you. For the the member from Nipissing. Uh, speaker, this week the Lake Nipissing stakeholders wrote directly to the Premier out of desperation and frustration. 
They're at a loss to understand how the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry turned down their request to continue to restock Lake Nipissing, as they've done for years, to reverse the decline of the walleye population. The ministry is entrenched in its position on Lake Nipissing, yet on its website they boast the fact that they help stock 1,200 uh, other water bodies in Ontario each and every year. The refusal to allow, allow stakeholders at their own expense to augment stocking efforts proves that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing at the ministry. Lake Nipissing is one of the most ecologically and economically important lakes in northeastern Ontario. But instead of working with partners to find solutions, the ministry just digs in its heels. The stakeholders' petition is now available for constituents to sign in my office and on my website. The Premier needs to act, and the minister needs to start asking his staff some hard questions. They should allow the stakeholders to continue to restock, again, at their own expense, as they always have, while submitting the ministry's data and conclusions for a third-party scientific review to explain how it's acceptable to stock 1,200 other Ontario water bodies, but not Lake Nipissing. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I rise today to showcase the fantastic girls in grades 7 and 8 at Rawlinson Community School who took part in my girls' government program. Girls' government is a program run by Equal Voice, which helps young girls interested in politics. I work closely with five bright young girls from Rawlinson Community School, Ryan, Santa, Alyssa, Penelope, Cheyenne, and their teacher, Ms. Emily Pramza. Since January, these girls worked alongside me and their teacher to learn about politics and to select a specific issue they like to champion. The girls selected mental health as their issue. Each of the girls engaged in lively debates selecting this issue. As well, they developed strategies on what we can do as a province to remediate, remediate this issue. With much research and discussion, these bright young girls from Rawlinson drafted a letter to Minister Hoskins indicating their specific concerns and perspectives on the provision of mental health care in Ontario. On May 27, I was happy to host my group here at Queen's Park, and I'm so happy that they had an opportunity to meet with Premier Wynne, with yourself, Mr. Speaker, and several MPPs throughout the day. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to Minister Hoskins, who personally met with the girls from Rawlinson to discuss how our government is working to tackle the issue of mental health. Mr. Speaker, the energy from the girls from Rawlinson helped me remind me of the importance of my role as a female politician in this legislature and as the first female MPP for the riding of Davenport. I wanted to thank them for their hard work and that I look forward to their bright careers going forward as active, engaged citizens in Davenport. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Speaker. Member Statements, the member from Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to acknowledge today for the residents of Durham and all of Ontario the success of the MSIFN, the Mississaugas of Scugag Island First Nation. I, ha I have the opportunity to meet regularly with Chief Kelly Larocca, who never misses an opportunity to tell me about the MSIFN community and the charity casino that they own, the Great Blue Heron Charity Casino in Durham Region. is a famous achievement in the, the Durham community and remains a great success for MSIFN as well as our, as our entire region. Great Blue Heron was financed, built and developed by the MSIFN as a result of a nation-to-nation -nation agreement with the Government of Ontario. The agreement was signed in 1993 and the casino opened in 1997. With the agreement came the opportunity for the MSIFN to, to initiate economic development and financial self-reliance. Overall, GBH has a direct and indirect economic benefits to the region of $264 million annually to gen to gen and generates more than 1,100 jobs. The unique assets in Durham represent independence and opportunity to the MSIFN and it's proven to be a a phenomenal success. My hope is that you will take the time to visit this wonderful casino. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.